see, none of you remembered your pelvises, so I brought one for you. It's like my teaching aid at all times. So I'm not sure what screen I'll look at. Hopefully, they'll both be the same. So I have quite a lot of slides, but there's not so many people. So if you have questions, you know, just ask. And, I'll, and if you have questions after, I'll stick around. So the first thing I always say for this talks about virtual reality, which is what I'm talking about, virtual unreality, uh, is that almost all of this work is done by these fine people, <laughs> all of my students who do all the work, and, uh, and other students and staff uh, that have helped us. And these are all taken pictures that have been taken in here at various meetings. Uh, and, and obviously, this fellow here uh, has helped us quite a lot with some of the research that we've been doing. So. Um, yeah, so I'm just reporting on what we've actually done. So I think many of you probably need a little education about what anatomy is. I think many of you just imagine it's just pointing at objects and saying, oh, this is, you know, this is a muscle and this is a, this nerve. It isn't really. It's, it, that's um, just the vocabulary. Uh, if you really want to know anatomy, it's really how all those part, parts work together. So identification is really important in the first step, but after that it gets more complex. And the crazy thing is that anatomy, even though it's probably the oldest part of medical education, it's been you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of teaching of anatomy, um, it's actually a center of really education innovation. If you ever get the chance to go to the American anatomy meetings, you'll see that really some great stuff going on. And so when we, you guys are imagining this sort of thing, and this is the dissection of this poor fellow who was hung in Amsterdam, but in fact, you know, it's more like this, where we're stealing bodies every night. No, it's not, never like that, right? The truth is that it's more like this. There's a lot of uh, 3D anatomy going on, these table-based anatomy things. Uh, we've got, you know, all sorts of applications that you can buy, huge money, like hundreds of millions of dollars of, of technology going into anatomy education, augmented reality applications. There's one that we built. Uh, and different types of 2D anatomy, looking at uh, imaging and correlating that with anatomy. Uh, this is some stuff that we did on, on different types of uh, CT and putting in different types of uh, contrast media and, and showing how that shows up. Um, and so you shouldn't be surprised that things like virtual reality and augmented reality really come up in anatomy, right? But the thing that always amazes me is just really how old anatomy um, uh, in the virtual world is. And so probably don't recognize, but stereoscopy, right, is just the act of seeing solids, which is really very simple, um, was really well known to da Vinci. And da Vinci said, you, you know, it's impossible that objects in a painting should appear with the same relief as those in the looking glass unless we look at them with only one eye. It's like amazing. I mean, absolutely hit it on top, right? It's a two eye sort of thing. Without that, you're not going to get very far. And so all you basically need for pretty good stereoscopy is, is two different images coming into your eye. And, and that's pretty much how it works. And the crazy thing is that the first artificial stereoscope was developed in 1838. So before even photography, uh, they had developed different ways of seeing things that were virtual, right? They weren't actually 3D, but they had moved the images slightly, given them to each eye slightly different, and they look stereoscopic. And so that's like the initial stereoscopic rig uh, that uh, Wheatstone made. And you can see that the two images are being reflected through those lenses, and that's how you've got the focus on them. And uh, there's, that's basically the way that it works. Things are not a lot more sophisticated than that right now. And, uh, and, and it actually all came before photography. So this is what Wheatstone was initially showing. Two images, one to each eye, slightly altered so that you could see them as, as, as three-dimensional objects. And right away, that actually took off. In the 1860s, it took off. And so people were beginning to send stereoscopic pictures of their adventures in Florida or or things like the war, it was a big deal to send these images back and see them in 3D using old stereoscopes. And this is sort of racy turn of the century things where people would send these images around. And then there was also anaglyphic images, right? And anaglyphs are this sort of thing uh, where you have the uh, red cyan uh, separation. And so the reason you get two different images is because you have one glass that blocks red and one glass, glass that blocks the cyan and you get two images coming into your eyes. And that was actually 1850s. So almost right away, people were, had artificial technology for seeing in, in 3D. And so we've played around with red cyan. And, it's, and, and there's actually a lot of computer generated uh, anaglyphic images and we're trying to get into that a little bit because it doesn't require quite so much technology to show it right 
Um, but stereoscopy for anatomy really started in a big way in 1905. And this guy uh, from Edinburgh started up a, a fantastic anatomy atlas. And this is jam packed with stereoscopic images all on those cards. And it essentially every piece of anatomy in the body was shot. And uh, these images, you can't tell that they're stereoscopic. They're actually beautiful stereoscopy. And we put them into an application that you use on your cell phone. But it's really very clear. They're all well labeled, very accurate. And uh, they would have all the muscles. They were all and even explained and all that. And so, you know, 120 years ago, 110 years ago, they had a 3D virtual anatomy atlas. And it never really went anywhere. There were 250 stereoscopic perfect views. And uh, people like JAMA, at the time, the Journal of American Medical Association, this is great value to anyone who wishes to study anatomy. The price is, seems considerable. I like them because they're already at this point saying, well, you know, this virtual stuff is so expensive. It still is. Um, but the labor and expense required is to be taken in consideration. It's funny, it's the same thing people tell you now. But the point is that uh, they said it was fantastic. Anatomy and Physiology, which is a huge journal at the time, it provides a ready means of refreshing your memory. And I mean, it was really well received. It was no evidence that that was ever uptaken by any anatomy school or medical school or anything. And you can still go to Kijiji and buy them if you want. You can still find them around every once in a while. Never reproduced, never used. Why? Right? Why, why is that? Why did this incredible landmark and technology of 110 years ago not work out, right? It's a good question. And, and you guys you guys might want to remember the Viewmaster. So some of us who are a little older, well, it wasn't a toy necessarily when, when I was a kid because people would send you Viewmaster reels of this exciting time that they had gone, say, to India or they'd gone to Australia and they would send you the Viewmaster of it. Um, most of you are a little bit younger would have seen just as a toy, which is like Disney pictures. But the truth was that uh, it was made in 1939. It's really good stereoscopy. I have to say it's really high quality stereoscopy. And you could get exciting things like Toronto and vicinity. You can imagine that one flew off the shelves. You could go and see all that. But the craziest thing is that by 1952, um, they started doing this thing, a stereoscopic atlas of human anatomy. They made 1,500 um, stereo pairs, 1,500 dissections of the body, the most beautiful dissections I have ever seen in my whole life, all made strictly to be used on the Viewmaster to get people out of the anatomy lab and be able to have anatomy anywhere in stereoscopic, stereoscopic, essentially virtual reality, because that's all you would see would be those images. That's what they look like. Uh, you would get this one in the right eye and that one in the left eye. You'd fuse them together and you'd have a 3D view. Um, and these are the very serious scientists. You can tell how serious they are uh, with the lab coats on. Uh, but the pictures are beautiful. And, uh, and, and if you can appreciate this, this is the vasculature of the posterior chamber of the eye. It's unbelievable. I don't even know how you would do that in order to keep those vessels um, feeding the posterior chamber look, looking that good. It's amazing to me. And there's the you know, dissections of the kidneys. They're beautiful stereoscopic images. And when I got here in the night, early 1980s, there was these full sets of them sitting around and nobody was using them. And I kind of ignored that until I became the uh, director and, and we still had them. I was like, man, we really ought to throw these out because nobody's using them. Uh, and, but at the time they came out, people lined up around the corners to see them because there was this amazing chance to see the body. And so uh, Robert Chase, who's I believe the head of the uh, American Anatomy Association at the time, said that uh, the two devoted men to science, a cooperative contribution, the first and only comprehensive stereo atlas in full color. And it was an amazing thing. And I can tell you the dissections are great. Uh, and you could even get it projected to a room. You could buy this thing, wear a pair of polarized glasses. This would polarize, give you one polarized image on each one, project it on a screen. You'd wear your funky polarized glasses and you'd get this beautiful 3D thing. And, uh, and we have one at Mac. In fact, we've shown it a number of times and it's beautiful. I mean, I can tell you the images are, are, are razor sharp. Um, but the old pa Bassett slide post-mortem, right? The collection was not rep reproduced, not even reproduced after its initial run. It was, they never made a student edition, which they promised they were going to do, never happened. No schools really ever adopted it for educational purposes. And there's hundreds and hundreds of unused copies of it around that you can pick up. 
And one of the what's the problem is just a nuisance to find all the material and nobody really wanted to, to use it in the end. We actually reinvigorated all of those images. We talked to the people of Massachusetts General and they had actually scanned every one of those images in 4K recently, free open access. We, we released a, uh, uh, virtual reality app. They wrote it up in the McMaster and there's a student using her cell phone with the virtual reality app in front of her and uh, they're using it in the lab to look at images and things like that so we can see them there. We're just testing now to see if it's actually a supplement and helping people. The one thing that you might have noticed and none of the stuff I've talked about has any data because <laughs> they didn't test anything. They just thought it was a good idea. But we're actually testing these things out and we've published a few things on them. Raiders of the Lost Atlas or nothing if not droll in anatomy, right? And uh, yeah, so there you go. So just a couple other quick things before I get into some heavy data. Most of the stuff that you've seen are polarized light stereoscopes. And then that was like 1891. And they actually use polarized, uh, I think it's a, a mineral uh, to look through. And uh, all you need is a polarizing set of lens. You know those because those are the ones that you use if you go to the theater. And uh, they're very popular. Uh, three, real 3D cinema that you see at the theater, that's a circular polarized image that you're getting a different feed to each eye. Uh, and, and, and so that's reasonably popular. People kind of find it entertaining at any rate. The worst and saddest thing is, is stereoscopic 3D TV. How many people bought a stereoscopic 3D TV? Because for a while there, you could almost not buy one that wasn't going to be stereoscopic. And then it just completely went nowhere. And they had the active crystal yeah so nobody bought one oh, that's good it didn't look like that <laughs> everybody wanted it to look like that but it really didn't and you have to wear these big clunchy glasses yeah. see there you go and nobody did and then that was going to transform completely everything because it would be 3d and you're showing it like i say shown nowhere by anyone <laughs> Anyway, onward. There's also, there's also auto stereoscopic things. And we have one in the lab if you're really interested in this. And auto stereoscopy means that when you stand there and you look at it, 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 <clears throat> it <laughs> you don't need glasses and it seems to pop out of the screen. It does it because the lenses are built in to the screen, if you can imagine. So at a certain spot, you get one lens focused on your left eye, one focused on your right eye amazing so a screen this big like smaller than this table ten thousand dollars but it's so cool so i bought one um and in order to test it right to see if it's really going to help people and uh yeah yeah i know i know anyway that's alioscopy and it's actually was developed uh to supplement surgery so surgery is very interested in these things because you can actually put small stereoscopic cameras <coughs> in laparoscopes and then you can see what's going on in the abdomen and watch it. It's very cool. Anyway, <clears throat> and then we've got X reality and that's, so extended reality then is what uh, most of you are kind of interested in, I think. And, and that puts it what we call the virtuality reality continuum. So virtual uh, reality uh, is going to be on this side. And this virtual reality is where you get nothing else except what's coming in through your glasses or through your headset. And normally it's a headset, I have to say. And that's the kind of thing you're kind of used to seeing. In the middle, we have like mixed reality. This is the dearly departed Google Glass, um, but that would be things like HoloLens and a few other uh, technologies are out there. Uh, and then on the far side, you have, um, this is HoloLens, and the far side you have, well, real reality, right? <laughs> this, all this, real. Um, and, and so it's, that's the simple one for people to see. And this is the great, I don't know if you saw that, ever saw that commercial. <laughs> the guy goes to the Hockey Hall of Fame. He says, when he puts on the real reality glasses and he walks around like, whoa, this is amazing. It's like you're right there. Because he was right there. I love that stuff. <clears throat> so, and the question really is what's better and what works. And, and, and so what happened was it's very frustrating in anatomy because we had we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of specimens and we all of a sudden had two medical campuses. And the question was, how are we gonna give all this good stuff to the other campuses? Should we digitize everything in 3D? Should it, and, and what does that really mean? So we had a real big challenge on our hands and that led me to figure out, should we scan all of these in 3D and take pictures on all sides or what's the things that's gonna work? And, uh, and so I went through the literature and I found almost nothing but terrible experiments. Most of them were straw man experiments where they show some terrible thing that we know is not gonna be really good, like some really bad 
you know, lecturer standing up and then comparing it to some fancy new object that everybody says is great. And they're saying, oh, look, the, fan the people can learn with this fancy new object. But it's not any kind of an experiment. In fact, the only real experiments I could find were, were done by, by uh, Jeff and Amit Garg and, and Anthony and, and a few different people like that. And so that's how, uh, that's basically how we got together uh, working on these things because I, I just couldn't believe that it was true. So the first study we did was actually called the learning modality study. And all we wanted to know was whether pictures of objects, virtual reality models, we called it virtual reality then and that we kind of regret it now because it's not, it, it was a 2D, it was an object that you could move seamlessly on a two dimensional screen, but it's 2D, right? It's just, you can move it. It's not three dimensional. And then also compared to like regular models. And I brought the human pelvis because this is the kind of thing that we're most interested in. This is, you know, this one has been to the lab longer than I have. Still works, still people learn from it. And then the real question was when, how do they learn anatomy on the cadaver? So we just had to have them learn in these different environments and then test them and see what happened. So, so what's so special about the pelvis? Um, well, I, I just, as one does, I Googled myself. And then you find out I, all the pictures on the internet have me holding a pelvis or talking about a pelvis or teaching about a pelvis. And uh, it is kind of strange. And then I realized that I come to meetings usually carrying a pelvis. So I suppose that's what happens. There's one of our new studies called Size Matters. That's the hip bone. <laughs> as big as you are. Um, I, but I am branching out. I noticed that the, the, the latest one, I, I'm actually, uh, it doesn't seem to be working in any recognizable way. Oh, it looks like uh, I have to turn off the screen. Okay, there we go. Oh, see, I've branched out. <laughs> the most latest picture has me holding a massive vertebra. So it's not just about the pelvis. It's getting to be where I think people are, it's like Freudian how much pelvis stuff I've done. Anyway, the study design was pretty simple, right? We took 60 people, we gave them three different ways to learn. Um, gave them 10 minutes to memorize 20 structures. That took us a long time to get to. And the reason that it's such a short amount of time for those structures is to stress people out a bit. <laughs> if you give them unlimited time, they can learn from anything, right? Give them a burnt out match, they'll figure it out. And then we gave them a 25 minute test. And the test <clears throat> was essentially 25 item test, but the time was unlimited. Um, you have to pay attention because we did the same, we do the same protocol over and over and over. And, uh, and we allow them as much time as they want and we give them uh, a word bank just so that we know the answers. Uh, the problem with the pelvis is they, they give you answers that are halfway right and you just don't know which one they meant. Like when you have the ilium and the ischium as two bones, you got a lot of the ilium and you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> so we just gave them a word bank so we knew what they were talking about. And, uh, and that's what happened. So the, this, is, uh, this is the label plastic model of the pelvis they had. This is our VR model, exactly the same, except in, the, in two dimensions. You notice that I'm, it's really a 2D rotatable or user interactive structure. And, uh, and then this is this the key views. It's stupid to show these on PowerPoint, right? Because they're all flat. <laughs> they all are 2D. But this was just front, back, and sides of an actual pelvis. I send you all the slides if you want them. You could save all the room on your, you could save you all the room on your cell phone. Yeah, no problem. And then so this was just front, back, and sides picture and uh, key views. And then we tested them on a cadaver pelvis because again, I don't actually care if you know plastic anatomy if you know it on a pelvis. And so how do you think people did? So I can tell you that this 2D virtual reality one we did cost us about $2,000. It's extremely accurate. You can rotate it in all ways. The plastic model did very, very nicely. They, they, that's pretty good. About 70% learned in a short period of time. Smart kids, we have it faster. And then we gave them key views. So that's just front, back, and sides. Not too surprising. They didn't do very well. But now we've got this VR pelvis, right, that they can rotate and they have all the right things. And the surprising thing is it's about as good as paper. And, and we redid this and redid this and redid this over and over and over and over again. And the crazy thing is the numbers we keep getting were the same numbers that, 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 that Jeff and Amidgar got 25 years ago. It's amazing. And yet our pelvis was so much more sophisticated in some ways. Certainly higher resolution, didn't seem to help. <laughs> exactly true. You, can, you cannot imagine how hard it is to publish this stuff. We just get 
nobody seems to want to believe it. Anyway, look at the difference though. <clears throat> 67 to 40 percent. It's a 27 percent deficit by giving them something that's two-dimensional when they could be learning from something that's truly three-dimensional. Uh, and that's a massive, I mean, anybody who does education research knows that, 27%. You just don't see results like that very often. So basically, it was just saying that those 2D VR things are crap. And, and, and the mass, vast majority, by the way, of the material that you can buy now from all these different companies is 2D. User interactive 2D. And we've never found that to be an effective means, certainly no better than the standard things that we have ever used. And, and the question again, the question is not whether you can learn, it's whether you can learn better. Like when we ask about a drug, we don't care if the drug works. We, it's, is it better than what we have, <laughs> right? If I give someone an antibiotic, I don't care if it necessarily clears the infection. Some of those antibiotics will, and you have all sorts of awful side effects. What you need to know is it better than what we're doing, right? Equipoise. Do we have it? And, and are we going to get anywhere? Anyway, we published this, and it was all good. But what's so great about those models, and that's actually when we got to be kind of on our own, because it was, why are models so darn good? Is it handling? How many of you think that just by handling this and using it in your hands will be a pretty significant part of learning? You have to vote. There's not enough of you here. You have to you think it's important to handle this, that it's, you have it in your hands? I think as an anatomist, I think that's one of the most important things you can do, right? Is to handle the material. So we, we want to do that. And the other thing is we, we, we showed them a 3D pelvis and they learned on a 3D pelvis, then we tested them on a 3D pelvis, right? So that's transfer appropriate processing, right? That's kind of giving them uh, uh, the inside track. So. So we wondered about those two things. So we went ahead and, and we tested them very straightforward. The turntable study was we took that pelvis and didn't allow you to handle it. We just put it on a turntable and then we tested you. So how do you think they would do now? Now we took away them handling it. Now you could just rotate it. Did they do better, worse, or about the same? What do you think? After worse. And 99% of people would say that they did worse. Certainly when you're standing up in front of three or 400 anatomists at the international meeting, they all sit put in, yeah, absolutely. Ah, it did not matter. It did not matter. And oh my God, the day that we found that we were pretty excited because it's like, how is that possible? We didn't really believe it. Right. So we went back and looked at more data and, and I've replicated this since. It's exactly the right numbers. There's no question about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, look at that, right? I, it's just, it's, it's, it's spooky. Uh, so almost everybody that we, we test these things on are undergraduate students without a lot of anatomy training. Because we can't, you can't, you can't have a lot of anatomy, you're going to ruin the whole experiment. So they're all bright, you know, 18 year olds. And what's that? Yeah, each a different group of 20. Yeah, so it's not like a crossover where we tested them on each object. You kind of run out of anatomy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's what happened. So that was great. <clears throat> Basically, it says it doesn't matter if you handle them. By the way, if you're keeping track, that means that X reality where there's no haptic feedback is probably pretty good. So people like that. It gets quoted in journals telling you that X reality is really good because you don't need haptic. But is it because of TAP, right? Transfer appropriate processing. So we did that experiment. And essentially what we were going to do then is we're going to take a VR pelvis. This is a 2D thing, right? And, uh, and then we've got our model on a table, which is clearly 3D. And then we're going to test them. 3D tested on pictures of a cadaver pelvis and then test them on an actual cadaver pelvis. So learning in 2D and 3D, testing in 2D and 3D. There's a lot of people because <laughs> you have to go through this whole process of them learning on the various ones and being tested, but pretty straightforward design. Like we're not, um, this is simple. So the top hypothesis would say, if I learned on 2D virtual reality, I'm not going to do well on that wet specimen because it's 3D, right? But if I learned in 2D and I take a picture of the wet specimen, I actually should do pretty well because it's from 2D to 2D, right? So that's 2D learning, 2D testing. That's what you are expecting if there is transfer appropriate processing. If you look at a turntable model, <clears throat> right? If I learned in 3D and then I have a picture of a wet specimen, I should actually do worse because now I'm, I learned it in 3D, but I'm forcing me to try to figure out something in two dimensions. So you probably do a little bit worse. 
And so how did the results turn out? Well, I'm not going to torture you with this one, but it turned out that um, if you, it didn't matter. When you learn in 2D, you do the same whether or not you're tested in 3D or tested in 2D. It, it just doesn't help you. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at? It didn't help you in the 2D environment. And the crazy thing is when you learn in 3D, it helps you a lot in a 2D environment, which is important for radiology and all sorts of things. We haven't explored that very much, but in fact, you can see that um, these people did really, uh, when they learn in 3D, you just do a lot better when it's stereoscopic. Um, and so no VR, no um, specimens and models are the best, right? So that clearly indicated to us that stereopsis is pretty damn important. <laughs> so, so that brought us into this whole idea of, of removing some stereoscopic vision. So what happened there is if binocular vision, which is giving us our stereopsis, is really important, then when we take it away, you should do worse, right? And that's true. If you take away person's stereoscopic vision, they do a lot worse. And, uh, and this is when you, they were monocular learning and testing, right? So we took away their non-dominant eye, not actually, we just covered it. <laughs> it was still there behind the thatch. And then um, they did, and, and if it's important, if you, if you have monocular learning and binocular testing, you should actually do a little bit better because you've got binocular vision for that. And that turns out to be true, which is fantastic, right? And the other thing is if you learn in two dimensions, if you take away stereoscopic vision here, where you have, uh, it shouldn't matter. And so here's monocular learning and binocular testing. It shouldn't matter, right? Because these are 2D anyway. You don't need stereoscopic vision. So they should be the same, whether you're monoscopic and stereoscopic. And that's exactly the case. <laughs> it's exactly the case. Again, filling us with joy because it <clears throat> was kind of, what we were thinking was going to happen. So it turns out that stereo stereoscopic vision is, is extremely important. And that really does explain it. And that virtual reality doesn't really work because it's not stereoscopic. No matter what they say, that it's 3D anatomy and blah, 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 blah. It's just marketing. And we published that uh, in 2018. And, uh, and, and that was, has been very well cited. That's good. But the thing is that X reality now is stereoscopic, right? At least ostensibly, it gives you two different vision, two different uh, images in each eye. So it should be. X reality says it's had grace presence. So we got ourselves a HoloLens for like $4,000 and we began to import in uh, 3D images. So what's the HoloLens? That's the sort of thing you see online. That's all done in post-production. In fact, it's all really inside your head. <laughs> um, it doesn't make holograms. Those are due for light interference. That's not how this works. It just gives you two different images. Everything you see online is aspirational. This is all the stuff they did for Cleveland Clinic. There's thousands and thousands of articles about them using HoloLens and getting rid of cadavers. There's not one article saying that they completely dumped the HoloLens over a year ago and they completely went back to cadavers. <laughs> um, not one. I mean, there are thousands of articles telling you how they did so well with all this virtual anatomy. It's, and it's embarrassing. Was that? Oh, there's no data. Of course not. And of course not. Um, and the field of view is very small, it, but it, it's not in my already part. You control it by uh, hand gestures, but not these. It's always like this and this and that. That's all you get. But people, as soon as you put it on, they start waving their arms like maniacs, like something's going to happen. It never does. On the other hand, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's mixed reality. It seems to be right in your environment. It's really neat. And it's a computer on your head. Come on. That's pretty good, right? Um, <clears throat> but it was being touted as completely solution for everything. One of the problems, it doesn't work well in bright light. So we built a testing facility specifically for it with black walls and little white circles or white squares so that it can register the room and figure out where it is. It doesn't like light from behind. So we only had mild light from the surface. It took a while to design that and, uh, and gave it a really high resolution object to look at uh, in that environment. And so we, anyway, it's, it's a lot of technical stuff. There's a HoloLens too, by the way. Uh, of course, they say that it's so much better that our results don't make any sense, but anyway. So the, just the question is basic. If it's, if it's convincing and stereoscopic, then it should be as good as a model, right? I mean, that's convincing and stereoscopic. And so we did the, the, we did the test. There's Lily who did a lot of the work with Giancarlo. And that's kind of what it looks like, actually. Obviously, this is just me sticking a picture in. It's beautiful and clear and interesting. 
And then all we did was in that same room, we put a plastic pelvis. Exactly the same conditions, right? Except one was through the lenses and one wasn't. And so how do you do with that mixed reality model? $4,000, high definition imported material. Mixed reality, good as the model. Mixed reality is about as good as a piece of paper for $4,000. And the thing that was really crazy was we had this idea, like if it's stereoscopic and that's important, uh, how is that gonna work out? If you remember when we had a plastic model and, and, and we took away monocular, uh, we made it monocular, so you, just, you, you did worse, right? Well, if you look at the mixed reality model and, and you take away stereo vision, what's gonna happen? It should get worse, right? Because stereoscopy is important. The funny thing is, not so funny, is that it doesn't make any difference. So what's that suggest? There's no convincing stereopsis being provided by HoloLens, right? <laughs> That's pretty sad when you think of the cost. So HoloLens is crap. I, 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 I don't wanna get too carried away and, and picking on them, but it's not great. So the other thing we can use is a full virtual reality headset like the HTC Vive. So imagine the same scans, but even higher quality imported in. Here's Lily in the, <laughs> with the Vive on. Notice we don't have to have a black room because the room is inside her head, man, right? It's all inside of the glasses. And she's learning there and her hands are controlling, moving and around and that sort of thing. And then the same old plastic pelvis on a stand to learn from. And so uh, virtual reality model, wet specimen is virtual reality as good as the plastic model, no, <laughs> significantly worse than a simple plastic model. And the crazy thing is, is it's better though than mixed reality, at least in that environment. But what's really interesting for this one, I re and I do mean it, remember this is when you, I'm just repeating a lens, uh, the thing here just to make, show you that when you lose stereo vision, you get worse on the model. But virtual reality is actually like <laughs> worse <laughs> than one-eyed, learning from the plastic model. But when you take stereopsis away from someone who's got virtual reality, what happens? What do you think, is it gonna be way worse, maybe better? Well, they get really bad. In fact, they get worse than the mixed reality model. When you take stereo stereoscopy away from someone in virtual reality, they actually do worse. And uh, that's the one that we just published uh, a few months ago. That was five reviewers they put on that. Let's just say that the reviews were vigorous and our response was similarly vigorous. And, uh, but it's published and it's true. Uh, it's really interesting material uh, and you can pick that up and look at it. So our experience is nine years of testing. There's lots of issues around X reality. Lots more testing needs to be done. Lots of issues in, in X reality. I mean, so many issues. If you want to find a rich area for research, I mean, <laughs> every time you turn over a rock, there's something to look at, right? And there's no data. People seem to think it's fine to be data free in this environment. One of them that I'm just working on now is what's this appropriate size of learning objects? In virtual reality, I can make everything any size I want. Everybody tries to make them bigger, but does that help? Probably not. But also I can print anything in any size I want now. Used to be that if I wanted to learn the tibia, the tibia came in tibia sized. Well, I can make the tibia anything I want now, right? Half size, double size, four times size. What's gonna help people? We literally have no idea. So that's our called our Size Matters project. And we're just, uh, we just got our first round of data going there. Um, what, what type of material is best learned in the X reality model? I mean, dissection is one of those cool things where maybe X reality is better because you can go backwards and forwards. See, dissection is on time's arrow, right? You take off a layer, you can't reattach it. But maybe in virtual reality, we can go backwards and forwards and maybe that's helpful. So we designed a virtual dissector and then we printed a 3D model that's exactly the same. So we have the virtual <laughs> model, and then we have exactly the same model, but physical. And then we're testing to see how people do with that. I'll show you some, if I have a bit of time. Um, what about learning? And everyone says the problem with some of these studies is people don't have a time to accommodate themselves because it's so new. What happens? Well, 
So we're doing studies now trying to figure out how long do people want before they start giving them other things to look at. Does it help them? <clears throat> Who knows? Not so far. <laughs> And, and there's other basic things like, I don't know what education conferences you guys have been going to, but the ones I go to generally aren't saying, you know, students need today is more screen time and more social isolation. I, I don't know. I, I seem to have missed that one. <laughs> but that's what you're getting, right? It's pretty hard to put a headset on by yourself in a room and not got screen time and complete isolation. And what about students with accommodation? Right? What if your stereoscopic vision is bad and you put them in that virtual environment? Well, then they're worse than paper, right? I mean, think about that for a second, right? So there's lots of technical issues, lots of rigorous development and uh, has to be done. Uh, and what's the real long-term cost? The, you know, these, these solutions I'm showing you were thousands of dollars. There's, you can easily spend eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 on a 2D table for learning anatomy when it's absolutely clear, absolutely clear that those 2D images are not as good as a plastic model. Uh, but one of the things that gets you is cyber sickness. And, and we have like maybe one in five, one in 10 people who can't complete some of our things. Why is it one in five to one in 10? It depends a lot on the device. Like in virtual reality, uh, people really have a lot of nausea. In mixed reality, not so bad. So one is worse than the other, but it's mostly due to the virgin accommodation problem. And I just want to quickly show you the physiology of it because that's my nature really. So this is your two eyes. This is <laughs> kind of primitive, but when, when we have to look at something like the skull, all we have to do to see that is we have to focus it on, the, on our retinas in the back. And we do that two ways. We, we can change the size of our lenses, right? And accommodate, and then, and, and then we can turn the eyes in, which is convergence. So now we, that gets closer. How do you deal with that? Well, you just turn your eyes in a little wee bit <laughs> and then you make your pupils smaller and then you can focus on the back. It's really simple. And we've been doing it for <laughs> all of hominid evolution, right? So that's what we do. And it's called vergence and accommodation. We do those things together. And there is our, uh, our accommodation. So we'll do the same thing, right? We all do that. It's perfectly normal. Now what happens, we, we take this image and we make it into a stereo pair. Watch this, a stereo pair. <laughs> and so what happens then is <clears throat> uh, we took an image of it as if it was say a meter away, right? And then we make a stereo pair of that and then we feed it to someone's glasses. Now we put that image where? Where's the virtual reality glass? Here. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> the focal length is way down. And what happens of course, is that you are going to, what are you gonna do with your pupils? Well, you're going to accommodate for something that's that far away. But virgins, there's plenty of accommodations, but your, your virgins is telling you that it's way the hell out there. Well, what happens, in, what happens in your brain when you feed it one image that says it's close and another image that says it's far apart? Your brain only deals with this sort of thing in one way. It makes you sick, right? Because the only other time that you would have that is when you know, you've got some nauseating stimulus coming in. So that's what causes a lot of it. And there's no solution for that. There's actually no way to do that. You can't stick something three centimeters from your eyes and tell your brain that it's, ten, you know, that it's two meters away. And you ever know with other things in virtual reality, what about the fact that everything is always completely in focus everywhere in virtual reality? It doesn't matter if it's here or if it's 10 kilometers away. That orc that's trying to kill you here is the same focus as the one that's, you know, five meters away. So you lose that. There's all sorts of parallax issues. I mean, it's a lot of things, right? I just have a quick question about that too. Yeah. So what if you, can you wear your glasses on most of these things? Yeah. Can you oh yeah, 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 yeah. You can, you can normally wear your, wear some glasses and, and that sort of thing. They, they're not less comfortable that way, but it doesn't matter in that sense. One of the things, and, and I've been raining on, on, on 3D imaging and, and that thing. There are times when it's useful though, and this is a nice one done by uh, Dong Mei Kyu and, and, um, and Tim. Tim's over at Western, good guy. And he's been doing some stuff, but what they're showing in 3D environments is things that you can't show any other way. And they're showing that it is actually better to show it in 3D than really not showing it at all. So the question really, sorry, is, is trying to find things that maybe are appropriate. There's lots of downsides, but what are things that maybe you could appropriately see? And that brought us to this idea that maybe we could do some virtual dissection. 
and that's what I was talking about. So there's our physical model. It's all made of fabric and 3D printed. We did this because the, 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 um, the anatomy of the pelvis is very complex, it's very delicate, and it's extremely difficult to make dissections of it. It just falls apart. And so we made this beautiful model, and then what we did is there's the person learning from it, and you just can peel stuff back. See, I did this strictly for you, so just see, look at that. See, peeled it back. Um, and so you can learn all the structures that way. So we took each of those things, and we scanned it with our HP visual light scanner, and we made a virtual one exactly the same. And in, so to move it, all you do is you use your, your controller and you go click and it moves it back and it folds it back in the same way and you can fold it forward. They all have labels and, you can, and that's how you learn. So that's the VR model. And there's uh, one of the students who helped make the model uh, and there she is learning in that uh, virtual environment. So what we did is a pretty simple crossover design. We had people learn in the virtual environment and then with the fabric pelvis and then take a short test. And then we, and then we crossed them over to learn in the other modality and they went through and then took a small test after that. So we randomized the structures on each one, but they didn't get this, you know, so they got, and then we, of course, we also counterbalanced it. That's why you end up with 160 people in the study, right? Because they had to learn with virtual and fa and the, or fabric, and then we crossed that over. But then we also had people who had the complete opposite of it. So I don't want to get into it too much. The design is pretty straightforward. But the deal is that they learned in both environments. And so what happened? It turned out it didn't make any difference at all. <laughs> and, and you're thinking to yourself, hey, that's not so good for virtual reality. That's actually the best result we've ever seen. <laughs> We've shown that it's, it's as good as this homemade uh, learning object that we had in the lab. Of course, and, and you know, we show one person. Normally, that's five or six people working together, right? In, 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 instead of um, uh, uh, Katrina there just standing by herself learning from it. One of the things you notice is look at the size of the error bar. Holy moly. I, I don't understand that. I think it's massive error bars. Uh, but it didn't, anyway, it didn't matter. It didn't matter in short-term learning of the anatomy, and it didn't matter for long-term. Uh, it didn't tell. One of the cool things is, is that they didn't forget very much. It, this is two days later. Uh, so that's cool. It does show you, I think, that learning in that uh, interactive environment is probably makes it a bit stickier. So that's good. And the other thing I wanted to point out is it's just the driving force in so much of this is mental rotation stability. And uh, if you look at uh, virtual reality in the short term. So this is people with low visual spatial ability and people with high visual spatial ability, huge difference. One of the things that's Im uh, important though, is that people with bad mental rotation stability, they're um, affected way more in the virtual environment. They do much worse in the virtual environment than they do in the physical environment, right? So again, it's one of those learning issues. If it, we're really concerned a little bit about that, so now do we have to start screening people for MRT as a, a learning uh, disorder? Our whole idea of going to binocular vision as the expl explanatory thing yeah. came about from a paper I read about gender differences in MRT, which showed that if you have the MRT on paper, right. you get massive gender differences. But if you build it on a Lego, the gender differences vanish. And we forgot, and, and we forgot, you know what, and we forgot to follow that up because I always wanted to do another, yeah. That's it, right there. Anyway. But look at that. Look at the, the huge um, problem in virtual reality if you have a poor visual spatial ability. Big concern. Again, when you're trying to accommodate, we're trying to help these people. <laughs> not make anatomy worse for them. So what we're saying is virtual reality, more expensive and only good for people who already are good at it, right? That's not what we were hoping for. One of the other things, remember I was saying, what about getting used to the environment? Um, so we designed this experiment to allow people to have an unlimited amount of time in a virtual environment before they did this experiment. And what we gave them was an interactive motor to look at, to study, to move around in, and let them do as much as they wanted before until they said, yeah, I'm absolutely ready for that virtual environment. So basically we had a VR familiarization phase. So imagine <laughs> now how many people we have in the study, right? Because we've got, we've got a, a counterbalance and then we've got to also have familiarization and non-familiarization, a lot of people. Um, but it turned out that familiarization in Mike one bit of difference. Um, it did not help. They allow whether we, they familiarized or not, it didn't make any difference. It didn't make difference in the short term. It didn't make difference in the long term. So uh, that's so. 
So why do people love this untested X reality so much? And, and I think a lot about this. And, and I came across this idea of implicatory denial. And what's implicatory denial is, is why you disagree with something. Because you don't like the implication of, of the fact, right? You don't like the idea that you're, that, that what it means to accept it. If you accept that X reality is really not as good as you think it is, there's so many people out there whose whole careers are based on being the cool kid who does all the, the high tech stuff and high tech's got to be better. People really don't like that implication that technology is not going to solve all our learning problems. And you know, it, we, they're just uncomfortable what it means. And it's not literal denial. They're not denying that what we did. They're not denying necessarily the facts, right? And they're, and they're not always in, in interpretive denial. They're not denying how we necessarily look at it. They just fundamentally say it can't be true because I believe in X reality. It's a religion. Like they're telling you that they believe for no particular fact. They believe because they don't like the implication of not believing. And the other thing is the Concord fallacy. And this is the one I love because you guys might remember the old Concord quit flying a few years ago. Sunk cost fallacy, they call us, because they put so much money into the Concord. They, they, it was supposed to cost 120 million, cost 2.2 billion dollars. And it lost money every year it flew. And they, why do they keep it flying? Was, yeah, except that it lost money. These the people were supposed to be making money, lost money all the time. Because they put so much money in, and there was so much prestige in having the fastest airline, they just thought, oh, we got to keep going. It's like, you know, your car breaks down, and you blow the engine, and you say, oh, well, okay, so you fix the engine, and the transmission goes, and you say to yourself, well, I should fix the transmission. No, don't get rid of that car. It's killing you because you've already wasted money. You're not going to get that money back that you've wasted, right? The cost is sunk and you've lost it. So you can't do anything about it. It's actually my cell phone, so I don't feel so bad. You, you, somehow you have that idea, right? And, and, and it's the prestige and all that and the investment. Now, think about what I've been telling you about some of this stuff. When I went to the International Federation of Anatomic Associations, there were eight companies that had invested tens of millions of dollars each to sell virtual reality solutions for anatomy. You tell me which of those companies has following the Concord fallacy the most? Prestige? Who's going to get that killer app to win, you know, the anatomy war? And, and money? Oh my God. I mean, unbelievable amount of money, right? So there's probably never been a better example of following the Concord fallacy than in some of these things. And it's not just the money. Think about the, the, the prestige of the people that are backing it up, that you want to be Case Western. That's the one that's leading the world because we took on X reality anatomy first. They don't report when they're wrong. I mean, it's, it's all very non-scientific, right? And that I think is why, right? They don't like the implication. And they certainly have a bad example of the sunk cost fallacy. And uh, I think that's it. So they've wasted, uh, they waste a lot of resources and they refuse to test them because they don't like the implication of what's going on. And so, you know, when we come to these, these solutions that people offer you, like we're scientists, right? Not sheep. Not that I hate sheep. I just came back from New Zealand. Lots of sheep. They were all lovely. But the point is that, but, you know, that we're not sheep. Like we, we have to look at real data in the literature. And, and to make, you know, proper decisions. And so if there ever was a lesson to take from this stuff, right, is that you should be spending some time really investigating these things. And that's why it's so much fun. <laughs> this stuff is falling down easy to study and fun because it just seems like you're constantly sticking the, you know, the, the, the twig in the wasp nest because people just want to believe it. They want to believe it and they will not disagree with your data. They, like, they can't, like uh, they're airtight studies that we do and they can't disagree with it in like a normal way. And so they just get angry. And it's just, it's unbelievable. I've never seen anything. It's, it, it's like if I was a biochemist and I was like myoglobin, like I'm, 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 what are you for? I'm for myoglobin. What does it do? Doesn't matter. I'm for myoglobin. Like what the hell is that? Like what, what does it do? Why is it important? What is it useful for? No, I'm just for myoglobin. That's it. That's my thing. Yeah, uh, uh, collector Paul's is longest. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ackland and another famous anatomist. Yeah. They basically. Oh, they
yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's 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 just it's amazing, you know. And and I, I I've given you know similar talks to this in some places, and it's unbelievable. Like the the rancor and anger like that comes out of people when when you tell them they says, man, this is the results, and we didn't fake this, and we've done it hundreds and hundreds. We're probably over a thousand people put through these different protocols. Thank God for all those students running the kids through the the different ones. I mean, we're sure. And you know, when you go to write a paper and then you look at the comparisons that people are doing, I'm just stuck with that now. I don't know how much time I have. Oh, good. Well, this is fantastic. I whipped through that stuff. Um, you, you go and you look at the studies and it's a very, quite a good one uh, that people keep saying is that virtual dissection um, uh, is as good as, as, as doing uh, regular three-dimensional dissection. And so, I'm, of course, I'm looking at that because we've got this virtual dissection paper that I'm working on. And I look at it and what they've done, it's, it's unbelievable. They take this one dissection of an arm no quality control, nothing really controlled at all, flop it down on the table and give them 20 minutes to study. And then they give the other group virtual reality glasses and label and label it, completely label a completely unrelated image, mind you. It's not a picture of this. This is a completely unrelated thing. And they say, look, they learn better from this completely unrelated object. It's the stupidest thing and it's published in a good journal. And I, I can't believe that anybody could have published that. And yet, when you write a paper, you've got to quote these things. And all you can do when you quote them is say, this is nonsense. But then that's the same people who review your paper. So you can imagine that. There's the one where they compared it to a prof drawing the stuff on a blackboard with yeah. chalk. Yeah. Yeah. That's the control. And, and, and it comes to the fundamental question is not whether people can learn in virtual reality. It's whether it's better. Like, we don't have a problem learning. It's, we're, we're trying to kick the ball down the field and do better. It's, 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 it's stupid to say you can learn from virtual reality. Was that the marketing standpoint, right? Virtual reality now better than standing in the broom closet. Like, like, <laughs> right? It's got to be better than what we have or at least comparable or something. But when it's not even comparable and in fact, we're showing more and more that it's in fact problematic for for lower functioning students like this is huge right but publishing that stuff holy smokes people get so excited at meetings. what really bothers me actually you go to meetings and you present this and someone will come to you and say yeah i always knew dissection was better you know what you're just as stupid as the people who think that virtual you don't have any data either <laughs> you know like really i mean other than experiments, like other than experience, they don't have experiments. They're just, they're just as biased, just in the other way. What's that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and there's, there's, it's not invalid to think that, um, but it's, it's, it, but it's not data driven. Other than experience, I mean, it's the lowest level of, of data, right? But I, 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 I was joking with a guy. That's what we should write on these things, you know. Like virtual anatomy now better than nothing. <laughs> like, yeah, you're like, I don't think they're going to sell so many. And when you see the money behind these, like, I looked at the valuation of some of these companies and the amount of venture capital, there's so much venture capital around, and it's being poured into these things because it's so, think how cool that is. If you can crack that nut of being able to allow everybody to have access to, you know, all this fantastic anatomy without the nu nuisance. And I run an anatomy lab, you know, cadavers are a nuisance. Keeping a lab's a nuisance, it's not easy, but it's so, you know, it seems so great that, that the, they want it to work. But, you know, you could wish and want, but it doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, I don't uh, want to belabor that too much. But uh, so you guys any, have any more questions about all this stuff? It's, uh, I mean, I'm more than happy to talk about, I've got lots of other stuff we're doing as well I, the size matters one is so much fun right like think of that all those years of evolution and then all of a sudden someone says now what size of an ob what size of a femur do you want to look at what size of a pelvis <laughs> nobody could ask that ever because they always just gave it pelvis size right i, I had seen the poster presentation uh, last summer for that and yeah yeah i just really remember we were sorting out the printing. Yeah, yeah and it yeah. seemed it seemed, as far as I could tell, that the most appropriate size, based on the data you had, was normal <laughs> for certain objects. Okay. Yeah. See, that's the thing. So. That's the bacteria.
<laughs> yeah. We, well, but so so that's the that was the big challenge is to fill in the data gaps. So we were. Um, it's certainly the the pelvis uh, is actually just fine in normal size. Vertebra not so much. Four x four times the size of the vertebra, even eight times the size of the vertebra, and people are still improving how, how quickly they learn. Yeah, so, and then we, so we had to fill in a lot of gaps, because initially, incidentally, we were doing half size, one size, twice, four times. Well, that's kind of stupid. We didn't think so, but we, when we realized that a four times pelvis is, you know, this big, and a four times vertebra is this big. So then we started to go with scales, like sizes, right? Not scaled, but actual sizes. But then what size? Seriously, what size? Is it, is it the length, width, depth? I mean, that's certainly one expression of it. Just like twice normal is an expression of size. Uh, how about volume? How about the sphere, the minimum size sphere that this would sit on? You can measure size a lot of different ways. And there's, and which one's best? I mean, honestly, you can, you can spend a lot of time thinking about that, <laughs> as we have. But what we're finding, and, and, and I'm, I don't want to prejudice everything, because we, we were just doing the final, um, we get four more people to run through a protocol that we just did. It's looking like 15 to 20 centimeters is, in fact, the size. And the 15 to 20 centimeters length, width, depth added up. And that seems to be a good size. But so this is like my next like, thing that I think about at night. I'd love to make a body in, and make every single object the right size for learning. <laughs> so the, the feet would be this big and the femurs are this short. And, or, it looked like the homunculus, you know, projected on the brain. But uh, yeah, so, but those are like important questions. And then, yeah. And, and the, from what I'm gathering at the moment, the majority of what you're looking at is initial anatomy learning. Yeah, yeah. So much of what we're doing is, is it, the nice thing about it is very testable. Yep. And and the other thing is that if you don't know the names, you don't know anything. Like you, can't, man, you're really not going to get. It's like people ask me about this. I said, well, what about deep learning? And I, I I'm a little suspicious of of that. It, not that I think perhaps there's more learning. I'm not sure how much. Deeper it is per se. <laughs> it's just more, and 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 so is it fundamentally different than learning the name of the structure? I think there's a lot more to learn, but I'm not sure that each individual thing you learn is fundamentally different in that in that start. That's kind of a hypothesis. And the other the other interesting thing about that is that um, um, the the testability of it and the and the test retest reliability. Oh man. Fantastic, and I know that's looking under the light for your keys because of, you know and the, because the light's better. But it, it, we tried that, and we tried like um, nominative anatomy, like just name specs, but also functional, like if you put a muscle from here to here, which direction would that move? We don't ever find any difference. So either we're not really asking functional anatomy questions, so I kind of doubt, but, or it doesn't matter. I'm an osteopathic manual yeah. practitioner, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of people in my profession that get really hot for a lot of things yeah. uh, that they shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> right, the, like the sacrum. Like I don't know why they like the sacrum so much. They just well, really like well, the pelvis. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> it's, it's it's interesting, but they believe that they can palpate it moving like two that. to four degrees. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. So I mean, it's yeah. over. It's over. Yeah. It's done. I was just thinking my call was a goal. <laughs> <laughs>